The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today's topic is liquid gas condensation. And uh, throughout this course, I have already mentioned two different perspectives on the same phenomena, transition between liquid and gas. One perspective was when we looked at uh, the phase diagram. Even in the first lecture, I mentioned that if we look at uh, uh, something like uh, water, as a function of pressure and temperature, it can exist in three different phases. Uh, there is the gas phase, which you have at high temperatures and low pressures. At low temperatures and uh, high pressures, you have the liquid phase. And uh, of course, uh, at very low uh, temperatures, you also have the possibility of the solid phase. And our concern at some point was to think about the location of the coexistence of the three phases, and that was set as the uh, basis of uh, uh, temperature, 273.16. Actually, what we are going to focus now is not this part of the phase diagram, but the portion that consists of the uh, transition between liquid and gas phases. And this uh, coexistence line actually terminates at what is called a critical point that we will talk about more today at a particular value of Tc and Pc. An equivalent perspective that we have looked at, and I just want to make sure that you have both of these in mind and know the relationship between them, is to look at isotherms. Basically, we also looked at cases where we looked at isotherms of pressure versus volume. And uh, the statement was that if we look at this system at uh, high enough temperatures and low enough pressures. So we, let's say, pick this temperature and scan along a line such as this. It would be equivalent over here to have some kind of a uh, isotherm that is kind of uh, potentially a distorted version of an ideal gas hyperbola. Now, if we were to look at uh, Another isotherm that corresponds to a scan over here, then what would happen is that it will cross this line of the coexistence. Part of it would fall in the liquid phase. Part of it would fall in the gas phase. And if we draw the corresponding isotherm, it look, would look something like this. There would be a portion that would correspond to being in the liquid there would be a portion that would correspond to being in the gas. And this line, this point where you hit this line, would correspond to a coexistence. Essentially, you could change the volume of a container. And at high volumes, you would start with entirety gas. At the same pressure and temperature, you could squeeze it, and some of the gas would co get converted to liquid, and you would have a coexistence of gas and liquid until you squeezed it sufficiently, still maintaining the same pressure and temperature, till your container was fully liquid. So that's a different type of isotherm. And uh, what we discussed was that basically there is a coexistence boundary that separates 
the first and the second types of isotherms. And uh, presumably in between, there is some trajectory that would correspond to basically being exactly at the boundary. And it would look something like this. This would be the trajectory that you would have at Tc. The location Pc is the same, of course. So basically, I can carry this out. So there is the same Pc that would occur here. And uh, uh, there would be some particular Vc, but that depends on the amount of material that I have. OK? So we are going to try to understand what is happening here. And in particular, we note that suddenly we have to deal with cases where there are singularities in our uh, uh, thermodynamic parameters. There's some thermodynamic parameter that I'm uh, scanning as I go across the system will not be varying continuously. It has these kinds of discontinuities in it. And how did these continuities appear? And how can we account for these phase tra uh, transitions, given the formalisms that we have developed for uh, studying uh, thermodynamic functions? And in particular, uh, let's, for example, start with the canonical prescription, where uh, I state, let's say, that I have volume and temperature of a six fixed number of particles. And I want to figure out thermodynamic properties. In this perspective, what I need to calculate is a partition function. And we've seen that the partition function is obtained by integrating over all degrees of freedom, which are basically the coordinates and momenta of particles that make up this gas. So I have to do d cubed <coughs> pi, d cubed qi, uh, divide by h cubed divide by n factorial because of the way that we've been looking at things of energy. So I have e to the minus beta h. Uh, that has a part that is from the kinetic energy, which I can integrate immediately. And then it has a part that is from the potential energy of the interactions among all of these particles. OK? So somehow, if I could do these integrations, we already did them for an ideal gas, and nothing special happened. But presumably, if I could do that for the case of an interacting gas, buried within it would be the uh, properties of this uh, phase transition and the singularities, etc. cetera. So the question is, how does that happen? So last time we tried to do shortcuts, we started with uh, calculating a perturbative calculation in this potential, and then try to guess things. And maybe that was not so satisfactory. So today we'll take another approach to calculating this partition function, where the approximations and assumptions are more clearly stated. And we can see uh, what, uh, what happens. So I want to calculate this partition function. Okay? So part of that partition function that depends on the momenta, I can very easily uh, take care of. That gives me these factors of 1 over lambda. Again, as usual, my lambda is h over root 2 pi mkt. And then I have to do the integrations over all of the coordinates all of these coordinate integrations. And the potential that I'm going to be thinking about, so again, my u will be something like sum over pairs v of qi minus qj, where the typical form of this v as a function of the separation that I'm going to look at has presumably a part that is hardcore and a part that is attractive. Something like this. Okay? So, given that potential, 
what are the kinds of configurations I expect to have in my system? Well, let's see. Let's try to make a diagram. I have a huge number of particles that uh, don't come very close to each other. There's a hardcore repulsion. So maybe I can think of them as having some kind of a, a size, marbles, etc. And they are distributed so that they cannot come close to each other. More than the, that R0. And then I have to sum over all configurations that are compatible with their not crossing each other and calculate e to the minus beta u. Uh, so let's try to do some kind of uh, an approximation to this u. I claim that I can write this u as follows. I can write it as 1 half, basically this i less than j, I can write as 1 half all i not equal to j. So that's where the 1 half comes from. I will write it as 1 half, but not in this form, as an integral d cubed r, d cubed r prime, n of r, n of r prime, v of r minus r prime, where n of r is uh, sum over all particles, asking whether they are at uh, location r. Okay. So I can pick some particular position here. Let's call it R. Ask whether or not there is a particle there. Construct the density by summing over everybody. You can convince yourself that if I were to substitute this back over here, the integrals over R and R prime can be done, and they set R and R prime respectively to some QI and QJ, and I will get back the sum that I had before. Okay. So what is that thing doing? Essentially, it says pick some point R, and then look at some other point R prime, ask whether there are particles in that point, and then sum over all pairs of points R and R prime. So I change my perspective. Rather than calculating the energy by looking at particles, I essentially look at parts of space, ask how many particles there are. Now it kind of makes sense if I coarse grain this a little bit, that the density should be more or less the same in every single box. So I make the assumption of uniform density. I shouldn't say assumption. Let's call it an approximation of uniform density in which I replace this n of r by its average value, which is the number of particles per unit volume. OK? Then my u, I will take the n's outside. I will have 1 half n squared integral d cubed r, d cubed r prime, v of r minus r prime. Again, it really is a function of the relative distance. So I can integrate over the center of mass, if you like, to get one factor of volume. So I have 1 n squared v. And then I have an integral over the relative coordinate, d cubed r. Let's write it as 4 pi r squared dr, the potential as a function of separation. Now, the only configurations that are possible are ones that don't really uh, come closer than uh, wherever the particles are on top of each other. So really, there is some kind of a minimum uh, value over here. I mean, the maximum value, you could say, is the size of the box. But the typical range of potentials that we are thinking is much, much less than the size of the box. So for all intents and purposes, I can set the uh, value of the other part of the uh, thing to infinity. So what I'm doing is essentially I'm integrating this portion 
and uh, I can call the result of doing that to be minus u, y minus, because it's clearly the attractive portion in this picture that I'm integrating. And you can convince yourself that if I use the potential that I had before, yes, uh, last time around, which was minus u0 r0 over r to the sixth power, that this u is actually the omega that I was using uh, uh, times u0. But I will keep it as u to sort of uh, indicate that it could be a more general potential. But the specific potential that we were working with last time to calculate the second virial coefficient would correspond to that. So essentially, I claim that the configurations that I'm interested will give a contribution to the energy, which is minus whatever this u, zero, u is, n squared v divided by 2. Okay. Now clearly, not all configuration has the same energy. I mean, that's the whole thing. I have to really integrate over all configurations. I've sort of looked at an average contribution. There will be co uh, configurations where the particles are more bunched or separate, differently arranged, etc., and the energy would vary. But I expect that most of the time, I see something like the gas in this room. There is a uniform density, typically, the fluctuations in density I can ignore, and I will have a contribution such as this. So this factor I will replace by what I have over here. And what I have over here will give me e to the minus beta u uh, density squared. Actually, I can write as n squared over uh, v squared, one of the v's cancel here, I have 2v. OK? So that's the typical value of this quantity. But now I have to do the integrations over all of the q's. Yes? But in terms of the approximation you made, yes. the implications are that if you have a more complex potential, yes. you'll get into trouble with, for a given sample size, that will be less accurate. Would you, would you agree with that? What do you mean by a more complex potential? Until you tell me, I can't. I mean, I guess, and usually, I mean, I guess if you had like multi body terms, or maybe that's all. Okay. Term. So, certainly, what I have assumed here is a two body potential. If I had a three body potential, then I would have a term that would be density cubed. Yes. But then you would, my point is that, and maybe it, it's not a point, it's a question. For a given sample size, mm -hmm. I would imagine there's some relation between how small it can be and the complexity of the potential when you make this uniform density assumption. OK, we are always evaluating things in the thermodynamic limit. So ultimately, I'm always interested in n and v going to infinity while the ratio of n, of n over v is fixed. OK? So things, there are certainly problems associated with, let's say, extending the range of this integration to infinity, with essentially uh, not worrying about the walls of the container, etc. All of those effects are proportional to area. And in the thermodynamic limit, the ratio of area to volume goes to 0. I can ignore that. If I bring things to become smaller and smaller, then I need to worry about a lot of things, like do particles absorb on surfaces, etc. I don't want to do that. But if you are worrying about complexity of the potential, such as I assume things to be radially symmetric, you say, well, actually, if I think about oxygen molecules, uh, they are not spherical. They have dipole-dipole interactions, potentially, et cetera. All of those you can take care of by doing this integral more carefully. Ultimately, the value of your parameter u will be different. But I guess what I'm getting at is if you deviate from the, ther if you're doing it, if, if we're back when computers are not as fast and you can essentially approach the thermodynamic limit, mm -hmm. and you're doing a simulation and you want to use these as a tool, mm -hmm. then you get into those questions, right? Yes. But this framework should still work. Uh, no. This framework is an approximation intended to the answer the following question. How is it possible that singularities can emerge? And we will see shortly that the origin of the emergence of singularities is precisely this. 
And if I don't, don't have that, then I don't have singularities. So truly, when you do a computer simulation with 10 million particles, you will not see the singularity. It emerges only in the thermodynamic limit. And my point here is to sort of start from that limit. Once we understand that limit, then maybe we can better answer your question about limitations of computer simulation. OK? So, so I've said that there's basically configurations that typically give this Boltzmann weight. But how many configuration? I can certainly move these particles around. So, and therefore, I have to see what the value of the, these integrations are. OK? So I will do so as follows. I will say that the first particle, if there was nobody else, so I have to do this integration over q1, q2, q3. And I have some constraints in the space that the Qs cannot come closer to, get to each other than this distance. So what I'm going to try to calculate now is how this factor of v to the n that we would have normally put here for ideal gases gets modified. Well, I say that the first particle that I put in the box can explore the entire space. If I had two particles, the second particle could explore everything except the region that is excluded by the first particle. The second particle that I put in can explore the space minus the region that is excluded by the first two particles. And the last, the end particle, the space except the region that is excluded by the first n minus 1. This is an approximation. Right? So if I have three particles, the space that is excluded for the third particle can be more than this if the two particles are kind of close to each other. If you have two billiard balls that are kind of close to each other, the region between them is also excluded for the third particle. We are throwing that out. And one can show that that is really throwing out things that are higher order in the ratio of omega over v. So if you like, this is really an expansion in omega over v. And I have calculated things correctly to order of omega over v. And if I am consistent with that, and I multiply all of these things together, the first term is v to the n. And then I have 1 minus omega plus 2 omega plus all the way to n minus 1 omega, which then basically sums out to 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way to n minus 1, which is n, n minus 1 over 2 in the large n limit. It's the same thing as n squared over 2. And this whole thing is raised to the power, uh, OK. This whole thing I can approximate by v minus n omega over 2 squared. There are various ways of seeing this. I mean, one way of say, seeing this is to pair things one from one end and one from the other end, and then multiply them together. When you multiply them, you would have a term that would go, be v squared, a term that would be proportional to v omega and would be the sum of the coefficients of omega from the two. And you can see that if I pick, say, uh, alpha term from this side, n minus alpha minus 1 term from the other side, add them up, the alphas cancel out. n and n minus 1 are roughly the same. So basically, the square of two of them is the same as the square of v minus uh, n omega over 2. And then I can repeat that for all pairs, and I get this. Sorry. So the statement is that the effect of the excluded volumes, since it is joint effect of mutually excluding each other, 
is that V to the N that I have for ideal gas, each one of them can go over the entire place, gets replaced by V minus something to the power of N, and that something is N omega over 2. Plus higher orders in powers of omega over 2. Okay. So I will call this a mean field estimate. Really, it's a, an average density estimate. But this kind of approximation is typically done for magnetic systems. And in that context, this, the name of mean field has stuck. And the ultimate result is that my estimation for the partition function is uh, 1 over n factorial lambda to the power of 3n, v minus n omega over 2 raised to the power of n because of the uh, excluded volume. And because of the Boltzmann weight of the attraction between particles, I have a term which is e to the minus beta u n squared over 2. OK? So the approximations are clear, clear under what set of assumptions I get this uh, estimate for the partition function. Once I have the partition function, I can calculate the pressure because log z is going to be related to free energy. Derivative of the free energy with respect to uh, volume will give me the pressure. And you can ultimately check that the formula is that beta p is uh, d log z by dv. That's the correct formula. And because we are doing this in the canonical formalism that I emphasized over here, let's call this p that we get through this process beta p canonical. Okay. So when I take log z, there is a bunch of terms that I don't really care about because they don't have v dependence from n factorial lambda to the uh, power of 3n, but I have n times log of v minus n omega over 2. So that has v dependence. Take the derivative of log of v minus uh, n omega over 2. What do I get? I get v minus n omega over 2. The other term, when I take the log, I have a minus beta u n squared over 2v. So then I take a derivative of this 1 over v. I will get minus 1 over v squared. So I have a term here, which is beta u over 2 n squared over v squared. Okay. Let's multiply by kt so that we have the formula for that. Uh, P canonical. P canonical is then nkt v minus n omega over 2. And then I have, uh, I think I made a sign error here. Yes, the sign error that I made is as follows. Note that the potential is attractive. So I have a minus u here. So when I exponentiate that, it becomes a plus here and will be a plus here. And therefore, I will have a minus here. And I will have a minus uh, u over 2 times the density squared. OK? So what did we arrive at? We arrived at the Van der Waals equation. So we discussed already last time around that if I now look at the isotherms 
pressure volume at different temperatures. At high temperatures, I have no problem. I will get things that uh, uh, look reasonable, except that I have to uh, terminate at something that is related to this uh, uh, excluded volume. Whereas if I go to low temperatures, what happens is that the kind of isotherms that I get have uh, a structure that is kind of like this and uh, incorporates a region which violates everything that we know about thermodynamics, is not stable, etc. Okay? So what happened here? I did a calculation. You can see every step of the calculation over there. Why does it give me nonsense? Everything that you need to know is on the board. Suggestions? Yeah? On um, the assumption of uniform density in a phase transition? Right. What's the picture that I put over here? If I draw the box that corresponds to what is happening over there, what's going on in the box? So there is a box. I have particles in it. And I'm in the region where this nonsense is happening. What is actually happening in reality? What is actually happening in reality is that uh, I get some of the particles to condense in a liquid drop somewhere. And then there is basically the rest of them floating around as a gas. Right? So clearly, I cannot, for this configuration that I have over here, calculate energy and contribution this way. So coexistence implies non-uniform density. Okay. So what do we do? I want to carry out this calculation. I want to stay as much as possible within this framework. And I can do it, but I need to do one other thing. Any suggestions? Yes? Try to describe both densities simultaneously. Try to describe both so densities. Average, you know the amount of liquid, you know the amount of vapor. On average, okay. I guess I could. I have an easier way of doing things. OK, so the easier way that I have on doing things is we have emphasized that in thermodynamics, we can look at different perspectives. The problem with this perspective of the canonical is that I know that I will encounter this singularity. I know that there's phase diagrams like this exist. Whereas if I use this prescription, I won't. So what's the difference is this prescription is determined in terms of pressure and temperature. So what I want to do is to replace the canonical perspective with what I will call the isobaric. It's the Gibbs canonical ensemble. In this context, it's called the isobaric ensemble, where rather than describing things at fixed volume, I describe things at fixed pressure. So I tell you what pressure, temperature, and the number of particles are. And then I calculate the corresponding uh, Gibbs partition function. Why does that help? Why that helps is because of what you see on the left side diagram. Is if I wanted to maintain this system at a fixed pressure rather than a fixed volume, I would replace one of the walls of this container with a piston, and then I would apply a particular value of pressure. Then you can see that a situation such as this does not occur. The, the piston will move 
so that ultimately I have a uniform density. If I'm uh, choosing my pressure to be up here, then it will be all liquid. If I choose my pressure to be down here, it will be all gas. So I have this piston on top. It does not tolerate coexistence. It will either keep everybody in the gas phase, or it will compress, change the volume so that everybody becomes liquid. So what I have done is I have gotten rid of the volume. And I do expect that in this ensemble, as I change pressure and go through this line, there is a discontinuity that I should observe in volume. Okay. So again, just think of the physics. Put a piston, what's going to happen? It's going to be either one or the other. And whether it is one or the other, I'm at uniform density. And so I should be able to use that approximation that I have over there. Okay. So mathematics, what does that mean? This uh, Gibbs version of the partition function in this isobaric ensemble, you don't fix the volume. You just integrate over all possible volumes weighted by this e to the minus beta PV that does the Laplace transform from one ensemble to the other of the partition function, which is at some fixed volume, uh, Vtn. Okay. And for this, we use the uh, uniform density approximation. So my Gibbs partition function, function of p, t, and n, is the integral 0 to infinity dv e to the minus beta pv. And uh, I guess I have uh, what would go over here would be log z of vtn. Again, this is answer to previous question. I am in the thermodynamic limit. I expect that this, which gives essentially the probabilities or the weights of different volumes, is going to be dominated by a single volume that makes the largest contribution to the thermodynamics or to this integration. Or this integration should be saddle point-like. So what I would do is I will call whatever is appearing here to be some function of v, because I'm integrating over v, and I'm going to look for its extremo. So basically, I expect that this, because of this saddle point, will be e to the uh, psi of v that maximizes this weight. Okay. So what do I have to do is I have to take d psi by dv and set that to 0. Well, part of it is simply uh, minus beta p. The other part of it is log, uh, d log z by dv. But d log z by dv I have up there. It's the same z that I'm calculating. It is beta p canonical. So this is none other than minus beta the p that I canonically uh, grant, uh, in this ensemble have set out, minus this p canonical that I calculated before, which is some function of the volume. Again, generally it's fine. We expect the different ensembles to correspond to each other. And essentially, that says that uh, most of the time, you will see that uh, uh, you're going to get the pressure calculated in this fashion and calculated canonically to be the same thing. Except that sometimes we seem to have ambiguity, because 
what I should do is I sh given that I have some particular value of pressure that I uh, emphasize exists in my uh, uh, isobaric ensemble, I calculate what the corresponding V is by solving this equation. What is this equation graphically? It says pick your P and figure out what volume in these canonical curves intersected. So the case that I drew has clearly one answer. I can go up here. I have one answer. But what do I do when I have a situation such as this? I have three answers. So in this ensemble, I say what the pressure is. And I ask, well, what's the volume? It says you should solve this equation to find the volume. I solve the equation graphically, and I have now three possible solutions. What does that mean? Well, all this equation says is that these solutions are extrema. Right? I said the derivative to 0. The task here is to find, if I have multiple solutions, the one that gives me the largest value over here. So what could be happening? What is happening is that when I'm integrating as a function of v, this integrand, which is e to the psi of v, right? I'm integrand. Uh, in the curve, let's call these curves over here number one. In the case number one, there is a clear solution. It means that I'm scanning in volume. There is a particular location that maximizes uh, this psi of v, and the corresponding volume is unambiguous. If I go and look at the curve, let's say, up here, Let's call that case number three. For case number three, it also hits the blue curve unambiguously at one point, which is at much lower volume. And so presumably, I have a situation such as this for my number two. Now, given these two cases, it is not surprising that the middle one, let's say number two here, corresponds to a situation where you have two maxima. So generically, presumably, case number two corresponds to something such as this. Okay? There are three solutions to setting the derivative to 0. There are three extrema. Two extrema correspond to maxima. One extremum corresponds to the minimum and falls between the two. And clearly, that corresponds to this portion that we say is unstable. It's clearly unstable because it's the least likely place that you're going to find something. Right? Not the least likely, but if you go a little bit to either side, the probabilities will increase. Okay. Yes? I think your indices don't correspond on the plot you've just drawn and on the PV diagram. Like, one, two, three in parentheses. Yes. And in two different cases, it doesn't correspond to uh, Let's pick number one. Yeah, number one is when we have a single maximum with the biggest. With the biggest volume, volume. yes. Now, number two should be oh, the one with yes, the maximum. Yes, that's right. And number three is one. Yeah. Uh, so this is number three. And this is number two. And for number two, I indicated that there are maxima that I in, uh, labeled 1, 2, and 3 without the parentheses that would presumably correspond to this. Okay. So then, you see, the, the, there is now no ambiguity. I have to pick among the three that uh, occur over there, the three solutions that correspond, that occur from the Van der Waals equation, the one that would give the highest uh, value for this function psi. 
actually what is psi if you think about this ensemble this ensemble is going to be dominated by minus beta PV at the location of the V that is thermodynamic. And this Z is E to the minus beta E. So there's a minus beta E. And there's omega, which gives me a beta TS. So it is this combination of thermodynamic quantities, which if you go and look at your extensivity characterization, is related to the chemical potential. So the value of the psi at the maximum is directly related to the chemical potential. And finding which one of these has the largest value corresponds to which solution has the lowest chemical potential. Remember, we were drawing this curve last time around where we integrated the van der Waals equation to calculate the chemical potential. And then we had multiple solutions for chemical potential. We picked the lowest one. Well, here's the justification. Okay. All right. So, so now what's happening? So the question that I asked is how can doing integrals such as this give you some singularity as you are scanning in, say, pressure temperature along a line such as this? And now we have the mechanism. Because presumably, as I go from here to here, the maximum that corresponds to the liquid uh, volume will get replaced with the maximum that corresponds to the gas volume or vice versa. So essentially, if you have a curve such as 2, then the value of your z, which is also e to the minus beta mu n, as we said, is determined by a contribution from here or here. Well, let's write both of them. I have e to the uh, psi corresponding to the V of the gas plus E to the psi corresponding to V of the liquid. Now, both of these quantities are quantities that in the large n limit will be exponentially large. So one or the other will dominate. And the mechanism of the phase transition is that as I change parameters, as I change my P, I go from a situation that is like this to a situation that is like this. The two maxima change heights. Okay, And it is because you are in the large end limit that this can be ex ex expressed either as being this or as being the other and not as a mixture. Because the mixture, you can write it that way, but it's a negligible contribution from one or the other. This is the answer I was giving in connection with computer simulations. Computer simulations, let's say you have 1,000 particles. You have e to the 1,000 times something, e to the 1,000 times another thing. And if you, for example, look at uh, uh, the curves for something like the density, you will find that you will start with the gas density. You ultimately have to go to the liquid density. In the true thermodynamic limit, there will be a discontinuity here. If you do a computer simulation with finite n, you will get a continuous curve joining one to the other. As you make your size of your system simulated bigger, this becomes sharper and sharper. But truly, a singularity will emerge only in the end goes to infinity limit. So phase transitions, et cetera, mathematically really exist only for infinite number of particles. But of course, for 10 to the 23 particles, the resolution you would need over here to see that it's actually going continuously from one to the other is uh, immeasurably small. OK. Any questions about that? I guess there was one other thing that maybe we should note. 
Uh, so if I ask what is the pressure that corresponds to the location of this phase transition, so what is the value of the pressure that separates uh, the liquid and gas, the location of the singularity, uh, I would have to find Tc from the following observation. That that's the pressure at which the two sides, psi of the gas, is the same thing as the psi of the liquid. Right? Or I'll Alternatively, the difference between them is equal to 0. Okay, And the difference between, I can write this kind of trivially as the integral of the derivative of the function. So dv uh, d psi by dv integrated between uh, the v of the liquid and the v of the gas. That integral should be 0. d psi by dv we established is this quantity. It is uh, beta integral from v liquid to v gas dv uh, p canonical of v minus this p transition that I want has to be 0. OK? So what do I have to do? It says that they identify the location of your PC such that if you integrate the canonical minus this PC all the way from the V of the gas to V of the liquid, this integral will give you 0. So this is the Maxwell construction that we were using last time. Again, it is equivalent to the fact that we stated that really this object is the same or related to the chemical potential. So I'm requiring that the chemical potential should be the same uh, as I go through the transition. Okay. Yes? Could you repeat the why? Why finite, finite size system does not exhibit phase okay. transition? Yes. So let's imagine that I have uh, two possibilities that appear as exponentials, but uh, uh, the number that is appearing in the exponential, which is the analog of n, uh, makes one of them to be positive, so I have e to the n uh, u, and the other to be negative. So my object is would, be, uh, would be something like this. Okay. Then what is this? This is related up to a factor of 2 to hyperbolic cosine of n u. Okay. And so this is like some kind of a partition function. And what we are interested in is something like the log of this quantity. And maybe if I take a derivative with respect to u of this, I will get something like the tanj of nu. Okay, So some kind, something like a tanj nu would be something like the expectation value of this quantity. It's either plus u or minus u. And it occurs, uh, so the average of it would be e to the n u minus e to the minus n u, e to the n u plus e to the minus n u. And so u would be some kind of an uh, expectation value of a quantity such as this. Now, what is this function look like, the function tanj? So for positive values, it goes to plus 1. For negative values, it goes to minus 1. And it's a perfectly continuous function. It goes to 0. Right? That's the tanj function. Now suppose I calculate this for n of uh, uh, 10. This is the curve that I drew. Suppose I draw the same curve for n of 100. 
Okay, for n of 100, I claim that the curve will look something like this. Because the slope that you have at the origin for the tang is grows like n. So basically, it becomes steeper and steeper. But ultimately, it has to saturate to one or the other. So, but for any, for even n of 1,000, then it's a finite slope. The slope here is related to 1,000 u, but it, 1,000, but it's finite. It is only in the limit where n goes to infinity, you would say that the function is either minus 1 or plus 1, depending on whether u is positive or negative. Okay? So the same thing happens. As I scan over here and ask what is the density, the density looks precisely like this tanch function. For finite values of the number of particles, the density would do something like this. It is only for infinite uh, number of particles that the density is discontinuous. Yes? Sir, on, on the plot which you draw initially and write that word, what are the axes over which you scan? Uh, over here? Yeah. Okay. Just what, what values or physical values are talking about? Okay, solution? pressure, right? So what, what I said was that if I scan across pressure, what I will see is a discontinuity, right? Yeah. So if you said that this is a result of a numerical experiment with finite number of particles. Okay. So, so what, what is like is the parameter of the experiment? The density. And what is the result? Okay. So you could have the density. So you could have, for example, exactly the situation that I have. Pressure. Right? This box that I'm showing you over here, you simulate on the computer. You have a box of finite volume. Okay. You put a piston on top of it. You simulate 1,000 particles inside. Okay. Thank you. Then you uh, scan as a function of pressure. You plot the density. Now, of course, if you want to simulate this, you have to increase both the number of particles and the volume of the box so that uh, the average density is fixed. And then you, you would see something. OK, any other questions? OK, let's stick with this picture. I kind of focused on the occurrence of the singularity, but now let's uh, see the exact location of this singularity. So I sort of uh, started this uh, lecture by labeling a PC, TC, VC. Well, what, what are their values? Well, OK. So uh, something that you know from stability is that the isotherms are constrained such that delta P, delta V has to be negative. Okay. Or writing delta v as a function of uh, uh, v or delta v, this is dp by dv along an isotherm delta v plus d2p by dv squared along the isotherm delta v squared. This is 1 half plus 1 sixth d cubed p dv cubed along the isotherm and so forth, this whole thing has to be uh, negative. Okay. Now, generically, I pick a point and a small value of delta v. And the statement is that along the isotherm, uh, this derivative has to be negative. So generically, what I have is that dp by dv for a physical isotherm has to be negative. And indeed, the reason we don't like that portion is because it violates this stability condition. Well, clearly, that will be broken at one point. The isotherm that corresponds to t equals to tc is not a generic isotherm. 
that's an isotherm that at some point it comes in tangentially. So there is over here a point where dp by dv is 0. And we already discussed this. If dp by dv is 0, then the second derivative in such an expansion must also be 0. Why? Because if it is non-zero, irrespective of whether it is positive or negative, since it multiplies delta v cubed, I will be able to pick a delta v such that the sign will be violated, either delta v of positive or delta v of negative. And clearly what it says is that over here, the simplest curve that you can have should not have a second order term, which would be like a parabola, but should be like a cubic. And that the sign of the cubic should be appropriately negative, so that delta v to the fourth is always positive, then you have the right thing. OK? So given that information, I have sufficient uh, parameters or information to calculate what the location of PC, TC, VC are for the van der Waals or other uh, approximate equation of states such as the one that you will encounter in the problem set. So let's stick with the van der Waals. So the van der Waals equation is that my P is uh, Actually, let's divide by uh, n. So it would be volume per particle. So I have introduced v to be the volume per particle, which is the inverse of the density, if you like, so that it is intensive. v minus, there is some excluded volume. Let's call excluded volume b. And then I have minus something that goes like the inverse of uh, this excluded volume, let's write it as A. So just I write those two parameters as A and B because I will be taking many derivatives and I don't want to write anything more complicated. OK, so that's the equation. We said that the location of this uh, critical point is obtained by the requirement that dp by dv should be 0. So what is that? It is minus kb t divided by v minus b squared plus 2a over v cubed. So I took one derivative. And the second derivative is now constrained also. So that's going to give me plus 2kt v minus b cubed minus 6a v to the fourth. Okay. Now, if I'm at the critical point, so I put c over here, this will be 0, and this will also be 0. So the conditions for the critical point are that, uh, first of all, uh, k b t c divided by v c minus b cubed should be 2a over vc cubed and 2kbtc vc minus b to the fourth power should be 6a divided by vc to the fourth power. Okay. So this is two equations for two unknowns, which are tc and vc. We can actually reduce it to one variable by dividing these two equations with each other. The division of the left-hand sides will give me vc minus b in the numerator divided by 2 in the denominator. The, the ratio of these two is simply vc over 3. And that's a one variable equation. Yes? When you are written the equations, the terms vc minus b and vc should come in different power. So the first equation should be vc minus b squared yes. and vc and in the bottom equation.
okay? Magically, the ratio does not get affected. <laughs> and therefore, neither does the answer, which is BC, which is 3D. So that's one parameter. I can substitute that VC into this equation and get what KVTC is. And uh, hopefully, you can see that this will become uh, 2B squared, which is 4B squared. So this gives me a factor of 8. A and ratio of these will give me one factor of B. So that's KVTC. And then if I substitute those in the first equation, I will get the value of PC. And uh, I happen to know that the answer, oops, this is going to be 27. I forgot because 3 cubed will give me 27. And PC here will give me 27 also. I believe B squared A, and there will be a factor of 1. The only thing that actually I wanted to get out of this, you can do this for any equation of state, etc. Point is that we now have some something to compare to experiment. We have a dimension less ratio, PCVC divided by KBTC. So I multiply these two numbers, I will get one ninth. And then I have here a factor of uh, 8. So the whole thing becomes a factor of 3 over 8, which is 0.375. Okay. So the point is that we constructed this uh, Van der Waals equation through some reasonable description of a gas. You would imagine that practically any type of gas that you have will have some kind of excluded volume. So that was one of the parameters that we used in calculating our uh, estimation for the partition function, ultimately getting this omega. And there's some kind of attraction at large distance that when I integrated over the entire range, gave us this factor of u. You would expect that to be quite generic. And once we sort of put this into this machinery, that generic thing makes a particular prediction. It means says that uh, pick any gas, find its critical point. Critical point occurs with for some value of PC density or inverse density VC and some characteristic temperature KBTC. This is a dimensionless ratio you can calculate for any gas. And based on this, semi-reasonable assumption that we made, no matter what you do, you should come up with a number that is around, uh, around this. Okay? So what do you find in experiment? You find that the values of this uh, combination from 0 0.28 to 0 0.33. So that's the kind of range that you find for this. So first of all, you don't find that it is the same for all gases. There is some variation. And that it's not this value of 3.8. So there are certainly now questions to be asked about the approximation, how you could uh, uh, evo uh, make it better could say, OK, actually, most of the gases, you are, don't have spherical potentials. You have things that are uh, diatomic, that shape is uh, maybe important. And so the estimation that we have for the energy, for the omega, et cetera, is uh, too approximate. Uh, there is something to that, because you find that uh, uh, you get more or less the same value in this range for gases that are similar, like helium, krypton, neon, argon, etc., they're kind of like each other. Oxygen, nitrogen, these diatomic mo molecules are kind of like each other. So, okay, so there is 
uh, some hope to maybe get a more universal description. So what is it that we are after? I mean, the, the thing that is so nice about the ideal gas law is that it doesn't matter what material you are looking at. You make it sufficiently dilute, you know exactly what the equation of state is. It would be good if we could extend that, if we could say something about interacting gases that also maybe depends on just a few parameters. So you don't have to go and do a huge calculation for the case of each gas, but you have some, something that has a sense of universality to it. So clearly, the Van der Waals equation is a step in that direction, but it is not quite good enough. So people said, well, maybe what we should do is increase the number of parameters. Because currently, we are constructing everything based on two parameters, the excluded volume and some integrated attraction. So those are the two parameters. And with two parameters, you really uh, can only fit two things. But we see that the ratio PCVC over KT is not fixed. It has a range. So maybe what we should do is to go to three parameters. So this hope is captured by the search for the law of corresponding states. So the hope is that Let's do a three-parameter system. Which parameters should I choose? Well, clearly, the different systems are characterized by their own PC, TC, and density at critical point. So maybe what I should do is I should measure all pressures, make them dimensionless by dividing by PC, and hope that there is some universal function that relates that to the ratio of all temperatures divided by Tc, all densities or inverse densities divided by the corresponding Vc. So is there such a curve? So that, that was a hope. And you go and play around with this curve and it is uh, with this suggestion and you can convince yourself very easily that it cannot be the case. One easy way to think about it is that if this was the case, then all of our virial expansions and all of the perturbative expansions that we had should also somehow collapse together with a few parameters. Whereas all of these complicated diagrams that we had with the uh, cycles and shapes and different things of the diagrams are really, you can calculate them. They're completely independent integrals. They will give you results that should not be collapsible into a single form. So this was a nice suggestion, but in reality does not work. So why am I telling you this? The reason I'm telling you this is that surprisingly, in the vicinity of this point, it does work. In the vicinity of this point, you can get a huge number of different system gases, krypton, argon, uh, carbon dioxide mixtures, a whole lot of things. And if you appropriately rescale your pressure, temperature, etc., for all of these gases, they come together and fall on exactly the same type of curve over here. Okay? So there is universality, just not over the entire phase diagram, but in the vicinity of this critical point. And so what is special about that, and why does that work? Okay? So I'll give you first an argument that says, well, it really should work. It shouldn't be a surprise. And then show that the simple argument is, in fact, wrong. But let's go through it, because we already put the elements of it over there. So let me try to figure out what the shape of these pressure versus volume curves are going to be for isotherms that correspond to different temperature close to Tc. So what I want to do is to calculate P as a function of volume, actually this reduced volume by the number of particles, 
and t. And I'll do the following. I will write this as an expansion, but in the following form. p of uh, vc t plus uh, dp by dv at uh, uh, vc t uh, times v minus vc plus 1 half d2p by dv squared at vc t v minus vc squared plus 1 6 d cubed p dv cubed at vc and t v minus vc cubed and so forth. So it's a function of two arguments. Really, it has an expansion in both deviation from this critical point along the v, uh, v direction, so going away from vc, as well as going in the t direction, going away from tc. But I organize it in this fashion and realize that actually these derivatives and all of the coefficients will be a function of t minus tc. So for example, p of v, c, and t starts with being whatever value I have at that critical point. And then if I go to higher temperatures, the pressure will go up. So there is some coefficient proportional to t minus tc plus higher order in t minus tc, and so forth. And actually, I expect this alpha to be positive. The next coefficient, dp by dv, vc tc, t, what do I expect? Well, right at this point, dp by dv, the slope, we said has to be 0 for the critical isotherm. So it starts with 0. And uh, then if I go and look at uh, a curve that corresponds to high temperatures, because of the stability, uh, the slope better be positive. So I have A t minus tc plus higher order. But I know that A is positive because of uh, uh, a, uh, a is negative because of stability. So let's write it in this fashion. Okay. What about the second derivative? Well, we said that if I look at a point where the first derivative is 0, the second derivative better be 0. So it starts also with 0. And then there is uh, some coefficient to order of t minus tc, and then higher order. And actually, I don't know anything about the sign of p. It can be both positive or negative. We don't know what it is. Now, the third derivative, it, there is no reason that it should start at 0. It will be some negative number, again, in order to ensure stability. And there will be higher order terms in t minus tc. But we have a structure such as this. So putting everything together. The statement is that if I look in the vicinity of the critical point, ask what should the uh, pressure root look like, you say, OK, it has to start with a constant that we call PC. Uh, it has uh, uh, this linear increase that I put over there. The first derivative is some negative number that is proportional to t minus tc multiplying by v minus vc. Uh, the third coefficient uh, is negative. Oh, and there's also a second, co uh, there's the second order coefficient and then there will be higher order terms. So 
there should be generically an expansion such as this. You say, well, OK, fine, what have we learned? I say, well, OK, let, let me tell you about something that we can experimentally measure. Let's look at the compressibility, kappa. Kappa is minus 1 over v dv by dp evaluated at whatever temperature you are looking at. So if I look at this, actually I have stated what dp by dv is. dv by dp would be the inverse of that. So this is going to give me, in the vicinity of this critical point, vca t minus tc. Okay. So the statement is, this is now something that I can go and ask my experimentalist friends to measure. Go and calculate the compressibility of this gas, plot it as a function of temperature, and the prediction is that the compressibility will diverge at t equals to tc. Okay? So the prediction is that it is 1 over a t minus tc. Okay, so they go and do the experiment. They do the experiment for a huge number of different systems, not just one system. And they come back and say, it is correct. The compressibility does diverge. But what we find is that irrespective of what gas we are looking at, and this is very universal, it goes with an exponent like this. Okay. So question is, maybe you made a mistake or you did something or whatever. Really, the big puzzle is, why do such different gases all over the spectrum, and even some things that are not gases but other types of things, all have the same divergence? Where did this number 1.24 come from? Okay. So, so there isn't a range like there was uh, 0.375. They all hit 1.24. They all hit 1.24, irrespective of whatever. It's a different quantity, though. I mean, it's not a number. It's an exponent. It's this a functional form. Why, this, why did this functional form come about? Another thing that you predict is the shape of the curve at Tc. So what we have said is that at t equals to Tc, the shape of this isotherm is essentially that p minus pc is cubic. It's proportional to v minus vc cubed. And the way that we said that is, OK, at that point, there is neither a slope nor a second derivative, so it should be cubic. And they say, OK, what do you find in experiment? You go and do the experiments. And again, for a whole huge range of materials, all of the data collapse. And you find a curve that is something like this with an exponent that is very close to 5, but it's not exactly 5. And again, why not 3? And why is it always the same number 5? How do you understand that? Well, I'll tell you why, why not 3. Why not 3? All of the things that I did here was based on the assumption that I could make an analytical expansion. The whole idea of writing a Taylor series is based on making an analytical series. Who told you that you can do an analytic series? Experiment tells you that it is actually something non-analytic. Why this form of non-analyticity? Why its universality? We won't explain in this course. If you want to find out, come to A334. <laughs>